All right, welcome to the third meeting of the online causal inference seminar. Today we have Elizabeth Tipton from Northwestern talk about will this intervention work in this population designing randomized trials for generalization. Uh, we are very excited about the talk. Uh, she will also stop from time to time to, uh, to allow for questions from the audience. Uh, then after the talk, we will have a discussion by Andrew Gelman. And then if we have some more time left, we will, we will open the floor to, to questions from the audience. All right, that's it from my side. Uh, Guillaume. All right, thanks, Dominic. Uh, so this week, we don't have a co-author um, uh, answering questions in the Q&A. So questions will be asked, uh, a few of them will be selected and, and, and asked to Beth um, when she pauses. So uh, if you want to ask a question, please ask it through the Q&A. If it's selected, I will ask you to raise your hand. So you have, you have an option to do that uh, in, the, um, in the menu bar. Please, please, please do not raise your hand until I've asked you to do so. Um, this will uh, make it easier for me to, um, to find you. All right, that's basically all I have on this end. Um, Beth, you can start whenever you want. Okay, do I need to then start sharing my screen? Is that how I start this? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, good. Thanks. Okay. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm really excited to get to share this work with um, this audience and I'm excited that you guys have put this together during this time. Um, I'm going to talk. Oops. Okay. Um, okay, so to just give a background to the work that I'm in. I, um, I'm a statistician, but I'm in, um, and I do work in the field of education. And so a lot of what I know of sort of on the ground experience working with applied researchers is in the education field, as well as sort of emerging more so also in the social psychology world where um, people are doing interventions in schools. Um, but in general, uh, as you, I'm sure in the causal inference community are aware, the uh, the number of randomized trials has been increasing dramatically since in the last 10 to 20 years. So 20 years ago, it was stated um, basically that it was impossible, people thought, to do randomized trials in education. Um, whereas now there have been a little bit over actually 500 um, efficacy and effectiveness trials funded by the Institute of Education Sciences alone in the government. That's not counting in through the National Science Foundation or other areas. Nudge experiments are becoming really common, as I'm sure many of you have worked in those areas of psychology and economics. And in JPAL and the World Bank, there's also a growing body of randomized trials um, evaluating various in interventions. So these, the methods I'm going to talk about can be applied um, and thought of more broadly to randomized trials in medicine or in health. It's just that this is the context that I am most aware of. Um, so while randomized trials are, are possible and are becoming more and more common, I'd say statistically, it, for those of us who know more complicated methods, the way that they're enacted is not necessarily ideal. Um, so for one thing, they're cluster randomized, which is just a fact. It's not really that the people are making a choice to be cluster randomized so much as um, for feasibility reasons of doing randomized trials, it's often sites are randomized. So what that means is you end up with a lot of participants, but actually a rather small study if you think about it. So often there's fewer than 50, probably more like 40 clusters that are being randomized. So you've got sort of statistical power limitations. Um, there's, the designs are simple. So while we know things like smart trials exist, um, they're not used that commonly. In, in most cases, the, it's a traditional two-arm design with um, a treatment arm, often with concerns about implementation variation, um, and then business as usual in the control group, which is a whole new also other problem that has been kind of emerging is this concern with what is business as usual, and is business as usual the same across conditions. Um, these studies are read, led by teams of experts in interventions, not in statistics. 
Um, and I think this is actually one of the places where perhaps the social sciences differ some from what happens in medical schools. So in medical schools, you have biostatisticians that are routinely part of the sort of planning processes of clinical trials, I think. Um, in education and the social sciences, that's not necessarily true. The model is not the same. So you don't necessarily have a statistician involved in every project. Um, and they're designed um, to meet what are called the What Works Clearinghouse um, guidelines. And these are guidelines that are sort of very listed about what needs to be, um, how things should be enacted, but it's kind of cookbooky, like you, you do it this way, and these are the ways that you, you sort of meet guidelines to get in. So that deals with concerns like attrition, for example. Um, but most importantly for this talk, what I would say is that, the, I, that they also all take place in samples purely of convenience. And I, I mean really convenience, and I'm gonna sort of talk a little bit more about that. Um, since the treatment effects are taking place in samples of convenience, the, it's I think pretty straightforward for the people in the causal inference world to, to imagine that the population average treatment effect and the sample average treatment effect are not necessarily the same thing. Um, and that, and there has been continued work in this area sort of showing that, that this is not just a simply academic sort of idea. So um, there's a paper by uh, bias from the sort of selection into an experiment can be at the same sort of um, scale or scope as non-random treatment assignment. Um, there's also um, increasing evidence that target populations and samples differ. Is my internet okay? Or are we good? Yep, it froze for a moment, but now it's fine. Okay, thanks. Something popped up. Okay, so that I got into this work and then, and then there's continued work in this area is through post hoc corrections. Um, so in the, this is the idea is it's basically you take the sample that you have in your study and you find some population data and you use some statistical approaches to reweight or um, project what the treatment effect would be um, in the population given the sample. So you can use propensity score methods. Um, there's work using maximum entropy weighting. There's work using bounding approaches. But the ideas are, are roughly kind of in the same class. You wait until after the study is over and you use some sort of fancy statistics to, to get better estimates. The, the limitations here, um, however, is that there um, is undercoverage. Um, and what I mean by undercoverage is that there are some units in the population that have a probability of being in the study of zero. Um, and so it's a nice assumption to make when you're developing methods that so long, you know, these methods are going to work, we're going to meet this ignorability condition so long as the as everybody has a non-zero probability of selection. But in many, many, maybe most of the examples that I've worked with in this case with data, there's always some part of the population that's not represented, which I think is not surprising if what you've done is, is sort of select a sample based upon convenience without ever looking at population data. It would actually be remarkable, I think, if it turned out that everybody had a chance of being in the study. So much for this reason, I, I really sort of shifted a lot of my research direction and started thinking, okay, I could focus on post hoc methods, but I don't think they're actually going to move the needle in the same way. It would be better to actually think about how to design better trials and to actually start studies thinking about generalization to policy relevant populations. And so what I'm going to present today is sort of my, it's sort of a progression of my thinking on this. Um, so the first part of what I'm going to talk about is, well, what is the status quo? Um, partly because I think sometimes even my own sense of what the status quo was when I went into this had turned out to be quite different than what the status quo actually was. Um, so again, in the education world, which I know the, the sort of the best, it turns out, and this is, um, I'm going to show you some graphs in a second, that the units, the sites that, and then the schools and individuals that are targeted um, for recruitment by by researchers tend to be in districts that are that are rather large. Um, they tend to be near research hubs in major cities. Again, not surprising that it would be near where people get grants. Um, and they often have prior relationships with schools. And then there's a whole set, there's like two parts to the selection process, right? There's the targeting of the units 
from the researcher. So your probably, you know, your selection probability. And then there's like the non-response kind of probability that comes next. So once contacted, many units decline participation. Um, so in one study we, we did with this, we found that it was because some schools had other programs in place. Very often it's that schools didn't have capacity to do research. Um, they had a leadership change. Um, they might never have actually responded to any phone calls or attempts at contacting them. Um, I think in, a, in another study we found that, you know, it was, it was like a math intervention study and they weren't interested in trying a new math program. They were only interested in a reading program. And so you're trying to sort of figure out how to convince places to, that, they, that they should do research. Um, What's really important though, is that historically very little information on this process has been recorded. So um, you could probably adjust for this, you could, or you could think about sort of these two different selection processes of the, the selection, the probability of being contacted and then the probability of responding or not responding. But actually these have just been compressed. So usually what we end up with, even in the best case would be a population and a sample and we don't know if the units that aren't in the sample aren't there i mean yeah the, the units that aren't in the sample are, are not there because they were never contacted or schools like them were never contacted or because they didn't volunteer to be in the study once contacted and we just can't know because nobody has collected this data um, so i like to sort of say that a study begins once units are recruited in it's sort of the parlance of like the what works clearinghouse or any of this ways of thinking that once random assignment occurs, we have all sorts of stati sophisticated statistical tools and things for people to worry about. So if you have collected your sample and randomly assigned them and then some leave your sample, there's all sorts of guidelines and attrition sorts of adjustments that you can do. And people know that they should be worried about attrition. Um, but if you haven't, you know, but if something happens before random assignment, let's say you got some schools into your study and before you've randomly assigned them, some of them leave the study and you have to recruit again, it's never, it's never, that information is not collected or reported anywhere. Okay, so this is from a paper that I have um, with Jessica Spybrook and um, students of ours. Um, and so what we did for this paper is we looked back at studies funded by IES from 2010 to 2015. Um, and we, we targeted about 40 studies and we were able to get, we interviewed, I mean, became like a qualitative researcher, which was an interesting change in my career. Um, we interviewed um, 37 of the PIs, three, three never responded to us. So we were interviewed 37 PIs about the process of recruitment. And then for 34 of them, we were able to get PIs to share with us the actual schools that took part in their studies. Um, to my knowledge, this is the largest data set that exists on sort of what actually, you know, the kinds of schools that are in studies. And so this is just a, a sort of a map of the general location of, the, of these. Um, what you can see from the map is that the coastal regions are much more represented, which is exactly where research hubs are. Um, and that sort of other parts of the country aren't. I was surprised to find, for example, that the South is not given the inequalities in education. I was surprised to find that there weren't more um, studies happening in sort of the Midwest and, and South. Um, another one of the analyses we did here is we were just looking at school district size. So people, researchers often say that they want to do um, studies in what they call medium school dis size districts. So medium districts have about 40 schools in them. Um, and it's sort of how people will define it. Well, not too large, like New York public schools is really hard to get on board to do studies there. It's really hard to get in through their IRB. But like Minneapolis or um, a, a, a sort of mid-sized district, that's a much easier place to do research. It turns out, however, that 40 schools is not actually, um, is not actually average. It's actually about a 95th percentile in terms of the school district size in the country. That actually 90% of schools have fewer than 11, 11 or fewer schools in the district. And so there's sort of a mismatch between what's ideal for researchers and what's actually happening in the population. Okay, so what would we like as statisticians? As statisticians, um, I, and I really did go into this thinking some of this was already happening, but it, it, it wasn't. So as statisticians, we would like to start with Okay, well, we are going to generalize. So we would probably like to start with a clearly defined target population. 
we would like to have eligibility criteria for who, you know, clearly defined for who can make it into a study and who can't. That eligibility criteria, for example, is very common in clinical trials. And when I talk to biostatisticians or people working in clinical trials, um, I think they're very surprised to find that, the, that there's not this eligibility criteria it's clearly specified in the social sciences, or at least in education. Um, very clearly, like, what are your estimates of interest? Is this really just about average treatment effects, or are you interested in other analyses? Resource constraints, like articulating clearly what those resource constraints and recruitment strategies are. In my experience, when I talk to people, they can sort of tell you what their plan is for recruitment and they can tell you what they're going to do, but you really have to probe at sort of, well, why are you doing it this way? Um, and then the last part is really what's most important, which is a discussion of possible sources of treatment effect heterogeneity. We, we would want to know, I mean, the only reason we have to worry about the sample that we have for making generalizations is if we think treatment effects vary. If they don't vary, if they're constant, we can just get whoever we want. But if they vary, then this is, this is the source of the differences between our sample and population average treatment effects. So you would think you would start, with, we, we want people to be doing these things and then to just sort of develop a sample selection strategy based upon this. Um, you know, I'm talking to a large group of sort of statistically minded causal inference people. So this seems all very obvious. And it is very much, by the way, a survey sampling problem. It's just, it's slightly different enough from survey sampling um, in the sort of usual sense that, um, that it's, it's not very easy to just take the ideas of survey sampling directly and just throw them in. So for example, we're talking about small samples, less than 50 or 60 schools, sometimes 20 to 40 schools. These are very small samples. We're focusing on estimating a, an average treatment effect, which is a difference, not estimating Y bar in one group and y, in Y bar in another. We're, we're thinking about a difference. So that changes sort of the precision. Refusal rates are very high. I mean, I know refusal rates are high in most surveys, but these are very high. And I would add the most important one is that people planning experiments don't know anything about survey sampling and they're not used to thinking about generalization. So it's not that they're already doing something and you're coming in as a statistician and offering them a better approach to doing what they're doing, but instead you're having to convince them that they need to do something that is frankly harder than what they were doing otherwise. Okay, so what do we need? So this, this is sort of my general thinking about my, my strategy for, for doing research. I think, okay, I want people to be doing those things. How do I get them to do those things? Um, and so I've sort of have, a, have had like a three-pronged approach and I, and I think these are approaches that other people could use as well in, in their work. Um, so one of them is that I have, I've had to work to convince people that generalization is a real problem. So I see it as a problem and um, many other researchers and you know, statisticians can see it as a straightforward problem. And frankly, it's interesting if I describe my work to just people in my family who are not statistically minded at all, it seems very obvious to people, the idea of generalization. But when you talk to people planning experiments, it is not obvious to them that this is a problem. I actually think that many of them have had to convince themselves that these things don't matter in order to continue doing the kinds of experiments that they do. Um, so I've done, so this is work that I've done like empirical work where I've been um, like the work I just showed you trying to sort of collect information to show people what's actually happening. Um, a second strand of my work and, and, and uh, a second strand of my work is focused on thinking about the constraints and how those affect research. And I really think this is something that's important. Um, it's easy to, it's, hard to figure out what people's constraints are. It's easy to develop methods where we say, here are our assumptions, let's move forward. It's harder to think, are my assumptions based upon what's actually happening in reality? So some constraints that affect this research. Um, data. So data, target population data is messy. It's, it's messy. It's, um, it's, you might have to get it from multiple sources. It's not like it's just easily there and everybody has it. Um, knowledge. So I think this is actually a real problem. People who, people who train to be interventionists, people who train to do studies on interventions, don't usually have knowledge about populations, sampling, demography, anything like that. They know a lot about how to design experiments, but not necessarily about populations. 
time. So the reason, uh, the next thing that I'm going to show you, this tool that I created, really came out of, of realizing that if I, if you wait until people are starting studies and they have funding to think about when, um, how they could generalize and how they can design their study, it's too late because funding agencies often require you to have already recruited part of your sample in order to apply for a grant. And so that means that recruitment is beginning when people don't yet have money. Um, and so you have to think, okay, so people need, they don't have time to go get data and knowledge in order to build up this capacity in order to do this very quickly. Um, and then the last part is money. So recruitment is expensive. Um, it's hard. I mean, it's, it's literally, it's very hard to get places to agree to be in studies. And so you have to sort of always be balancing the, these constraints. And then the last part, so in, you know, thinking about these constraints, and then the last part is what I'm going to focus a little bit on today, which is developing simple tools and methods that can work within these constraints to move the field forward. So I like to say I'm, a lot of this work that I'm going to show you in the generalizer is starting at a very simple place. And the idea is that asymptotically we're going to get to the right place, um, but that we have to lay the groundwork to get, to get started. Okay, I can pause here for some questions. Um, so um, uh, I have a very simple question. So um, in your experience being involved with, uh, with, with these kinds of, uh, uh, of experiment, it seems like it's not just the, uh, from, from the perspective of generalizability, it's not just the, the covariates that, that may restrict the, the generalizability, but also the type of intervention that's being used. So for instance, if the, if the intervention is say computer-based, then clearly you're only generalizing to, you, you can at most generalize to schools who have the possibility to, to implement this kind of intervention. Is this the kind of conversation that you have with, um, with practitioners when you're yes. uh, involved in these kinds of experiments? Yes, very much so. So I naively thought, um, you know, when I was developing methods, I'd say like, define your target population, then let's move on to now, like, let me tell you what you should do, as if like define your target population was going to be very easy. And in my experience, actually defining the target population is actually a very long, contentious process. Um, because there's often, there's often, so first of all, I found that I can be sitting around a table with people and, and not everybody automatically thinks that the study is about the same target population. People might have different ideas, but because nobody's had to articulate it, nobody yeah. has had to actually sort of say, well, wait, you think the study is about X and I think it's about Y. The second thing is there's, a, a, there's sort of the, the population you wish you could generalize to, and then there's probably the population you actually can generalize to. So um, yeah. people often start very broadly, like, I want this study to be about all poor schools or all schools in America, you know? And then you sort of start pointing out things like, well, you are requiring them to have computers. So yeah. um, we're going to have to figure out like a proxy for computers. So we might not have that data, but is there some sort of proxy? And that probably means that's not every school in America. Um, and you're not really willing to travel all of everywhere. So maybe you're going to have to sort of constrain that some, some, so your target population can be narrow, but it often, there's an iterative process between sort of of where people start with their population and where they kind of end, you know, in this, in yeah. this conversation. Okay. Thanks. That, that, that helps. Um, Jazz has a question for you. So let me unmute him. Uh, one second. Unmute. Jazz, you should be able uh, to speak now. All right. Great. Uh, can you guys hear me now? Mm -hmm. Yep. Hey, great. I have a follow-up question that's uh, closely related to Guillaume's. Is that, uh, I think you set it up in a very nice way that a lot about generalization is about um, the heterogeneity of the treatment effect. And one question I have is like, at least in the medical experience, narrow the treatment. You know, if it's like I give an injection that has certain amounts of heterogeneity, but it appears that partly because at least the treatment itself is pretty homogeneous even if the response or treatment is not, that has a certain amount of heterogeneity. As the treatment becomes more social, for example, right? Now the treatment itself involves a certain amount of heterogeneity, 
right? It's not like I don't have the same control that at least what I'm injecting into your body is the same. Your body may respond differently, but at least what's being injected is the same. But as treatments become more homogeneous, like say I'm, the treatment is telemedicine, Mm -hmm. Like that sounds homogeneous, but it actually isn't because one place my implement is slightly different than the other. Like the controls I have change. So now there's a second layer heterogeneity that develops, not just, I mean, it might look like treatment effect heterogeneity, but it's also just like you actually don't have one version of treatment. So in the education thing, my understanding is a lot of the treatments are more on the social end versus the mm -hmm. very tight. And uh, like, how does that, like, is there a framework for thinking that through? Or does that play out as a big problem here? as well um you know because the sad because the sad kind of thing is like the biggest effects we have are probably these looser less tight interventions but they're the hardest to make inferences about it, you summarized well i think what the problems are actually um they, they do tend to be social they tend to also be um school-wide interventions not individually based interventions so um not only is it um you know, a drug, it's like, you, you know, it's a needle and it goes in an arm and it, and it's each individual person is being studied. Um, and you know exactly what the dosage is here. It's often like, it is something about the ecosystem of the school. So for example, a curriculum study could be using a new math curriculum in all of second grade in a school. And so the dosage could be varying because some teachers will implement it. You know, even if it's a scripted program, some will implement it closer to that script than others will. Um, there can also be teacher effects of who's actually implementing it. There can be concerns about, um, so there could be some, all this implementation side variation of what the intervention actually is. Um, then there can also be the sort of actual treatment effect heterogeneity that's occurring. So it's, it's, there's, a, there's a lot of places for there to be variation in treatment and variation in treatment effects. Um, and given the difficulty I find with the generalization is just the sort of lack of population information. So we're working with very rudimentary population data sets. And so it becomes a conversation about really mechanism of the intervention. I mean, in order to talk about the target population, you have to talk about the mechanism of the intervention and sort of this pairing kind of between an intervention and a population. And these conversations are hard. Um, I'm always trying to convince people that just because these conversations are hard doesn't mean that we shouldn't have them because I think what's easy for people to do is to start with I'm not thinking about generalization and therefore um, it's a lot easier to just sort of go about doing this and then as soon as you shine the light and say well let's think about how this generalizes it can easily lead people to run back to saying well I can't this just clearly doesn't generalize it really is about these 40 schools and I can't I don't know, I have to make a lot of assumptions in order to think about generalization. And then to which I'm always left with, well, why are we doing a study about what happens in 40 schools? Like, don't we want to, I mean, aren't people going to use the results of this more broadly? So we have to have these hard conversations. And at very least, we can make our assumptions very clear. We can lay, lay clearly out for people what our thinking about this mechanism is and what our thinking about this population is. Um, and then, you know, the scientific world can then see it and sort of that can be up for debate, but it's not up for debate if nobody ever mentions it to start with. That makes sense. Thanks, Beth. Um, I think you should continue uh, so you have time to go through everything. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you now about a tool that I created. So um, just to begin, um, the goal, of, the goal of any sort of method towards generalization when you're sort of um, whether you're post hoc or planning is to meet a sam is typically to meet a sampling ignorability goal. And the idea is that the sample should be similar to the population on the covariates that explain a variation in treatment impacts. Um, and so this is sort of written out as a sampling ignorability um, condition. Now the difficulty is that sort of if you've met the sampling ignorability condition, then the average treatment effect you estimate in your sample general is unbiased for the population, but you can't really know because you only know the variables that you observe for related to treatment effect impacts and variation. You don't know, obviously, if those are the right variables. Um, okay, so in education, I, you know, I, I have to, I've had to start with sort of how do we get population data? What is the population data that we can use? Um, in education, we're fortunate in that there's um, 
in that it's often because it's cluster random assignment, so schools are randomized and interventions are typically whole school interventions um, or, you know, whole grade interventions, et cetera, that we can get sort of data frames for those schools in a way that if we were talking about individuals, this would be a little harder. Um, so in education, there's a data set called the Common Core of Data, which the National Center for Education Statistics actually compiles each state. This is like a major feat that occurred 20 years ago or something that each state actually aggregates their own data and then collects it and sends it to the gut to the federal government and then they combine it into this data set. So it does mean that it's usually about two, two or three years behind by the time that it's available to people. Um, there's also census level data, so you can get um, from the American Community Survey, there's um, a school district sort of aggregation of, of, of the survey that you can get district level data. If you're focused on an individual state, you can also look at state longitudinal data systems. Um, this is all in K through 12. Um, in higher ed, there's iPads data. I, I just worked with a group doing um, pre-K study and you for that pre-K study, we used a combination of data from Head Start programs, but also we aggregated a lot of data to the county level um, and sort of assumed that they would select counties and then find out what um, pre-K and her pre-K uh, programs exist in their places. Um, I have some other work with Laura Peck in which we were thinking about this in a social welfare context. So again, you've got census data and the American Community Survey data. We also sort of combined this with data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, as well as some other political data. So it's really thinking constantly about how to build these data frames. How do you sort of pull together data from a lot of different sources um, to, to know more about a population? Um, and then the, the, the tool that I've developed is really based upon what I think of as the magic of stratification. Um, so we know from both design-based and model-based sampling, we also know from post-stratification. So we know stratification, we know post-stratification, and Cochrane has work thinking about the magic of like five strata for in propensity scores, right? That just by stratifying, you make, to, you make things more similar. Um, and so it's a really simple, easy to use tool. Um, and so now we're thinking, however, that we would like to sort of get similarity on a lot of covariates. And what I mean is the conversation is first, what's your population? The second is what variables might matter for treatment effect variation? Can we find those variables in the population? And then well, now let's think about how to make sure our sample is similar to our population on that large set of potential treatment effect variation variables. Um, since we don't know what those are in advance and we're planning in advance, that 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 might be a much more comprehensive list than we might otherwise have afterwards. And we would like the sample and the population to be similar um, on these, So we but we have a large set of variables. So this is just a, a quick example um, from a, one paper that you might have student level, stu student level aggregates of variables about demographics. You might have community level aggregates um, based upon the American Community Survey and other census level variables. We might have things about school size, about district revenue, et cetera. So this is just, you know, this might be like a set of variables that you would have. Um, and then we're working under some pretty harsh constraints. So if, we, if I say we're gonna do some stratified sampling, we need to have very small numbers of strata. Um, and the reason they need to be small is that our sample sizes are small. Um, and that really, every additional stratum creates additional constraints, right? So if this doesn't feel, I, mean, I think this is obvious, but yet not obvious that um, if I'm going in and telling people, hey, you're usually doing sampling in such a way that you're getting a convenient sample. So you, when you go to a school district and they say, great, we'll give you 40 schools, you're like, great, I've got my 40 schools, I'm done. And now I'm telling you that actually you're gonna have these strata. And if you go, let's say you even have two strata, you go to the first place and they say they'll give you 40 schools and they all happen to be in stratum one, you're gonna actually have to either say, no, I don't want all those schools. Um, or you could take them all, but you still have to continue recruitment into another stratum. So thinking about generalization, is taking this process that was ad hoc and adding additional resource constraints and um, problems, which is why you want to have a smallish number of strata. Um, so the solution that I sort of generated um, several years ago was just to use k-means cluster analysis to do this, that if you just take these demographics and you look for similarity, they obviously everything in our social world tends to be correlated. 
um, that you could use k-means with something as simple as Gower's distance or another distance metric using standardized covariates um, in order to just sort of find homogeneous strata. Um, so the clusters become the strata. You end up with strata of different sizes. Some of them tend to be more homogeneous than others. Um, and you can sort of easily sort of describe this to people, I think, which is nice. There are other cases. I have another paper where we did this with propensity scores. Um, this is an example of a graphic that, that we have in the generalizer, but it, the idea is that in addition to providing people with the strata, and you've, so at the top you have the strata, and at the, um, col and the, the rows are these covariates, and then we've got these heat maps, but the idea is also it's telling people you've got six strata, and it's also helping people describe and understand how these strata are different than each other. So there's a lot of what I'm going to show you is about teaching people about populations as well. And then there's within stratum recruitment. So um, again, if you're talking to a crowd of statisticians as I am, it's pretty obvious that you know, people are sort of like, well, obviously you'll do random selection. Um, and sort of the state of the art says to use proportional allocation or name an allocation, and then within to randomly select. Um, but I am such a realist about things at this point that at this stage, I, I'm sort of like whatever happens within, within stratum recruitment, I'm sort of happy enough that they've used strata and that our, our samples are going to be somewhat similar because in practice, um, very often what happens is that there is a, a push and a pull here that people already have partners signed on for this intervention study. I come in and, you know, they come in and, and start developing a stratified sampling plan, but they already have 10 or 20 of their schools. They look to see which strata they're actually in and then they recruit the rest of their sample using the strata. Um, again, it'd be better if this were, if you can inject some randomness in this and, and um, but I like to say random sampling has been around for a while and people haven't been doing it. So anything, anything to get people moving towards the direction of, um, of, of thinking about the population is better than not. Okay. Uh, so the, oh, uh, yes. Sorry to interrupt you. You have around eight more minutes. Oh my gosh. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, so then the generalizer is a free web, web tool that I've um, created that does this. And so the idea of the generalizer is um, that it's standalone. And, and this is actually a, sort of a mission of mine at this point in terms of creating software for things. So um, the, the idea for the web tool is that it would be standalone. You, nobody would have to read anything. So a lot of times when we create software, we, we sort of say, well, and here's the user manual. Um, that somebody has to read as well. Um, or here's the paper you have to read to go along with it. So I didn't want that. Um, I wanted it to kind of combine data and statistics and teaching all in the same way. And I think this teaching part is really important. I wanted to make it simple. So to have language, um, simple language, simple design, simple error, it makes clear when people are making errors and for it to be useful to provide the reports, tables, figures, data that people needed um, in order to um, do their study. Um, and so a lot of what I learned in doing this came from, from working with a web programmer that's actually like a legitimate <laughs> web programmer who's taught me a lot about UX experience. So I'm going to show you this. And given that I only have eight minutes left, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of only give about two thirds of my talk and you guys can take home the rest of it. Um, but I want to sort of show you briefly. Can you see? Can you still see? Oh, I think sure. you have to switch share screen to your browser uh, now. Uh, I think that's right. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, great. Um, okay, so the, the generalizer tool, and you guys obviously can play with it yourself, but I just want to highlight a few things. One, there's demo mode. There's actually two parts to this. So I have other work that's about assessing um, similarity between samples and populations, and that's what the completed experiment side does. But if you go through the future experiment, which is part where you can name it so that it gives you sort of buy-in and it's gonna say the name of your study throughout. Um, and then this is what I mean as an example of, of sort of teaching. I'm not assuming people know anything about generalization. I'm assuming that my user knows something about planning a study and planning an intervention study, but they don't know anything else. And so I have to actually guide them through and, and teach them to think about generalization while they're doing this. 
Um, and so it even highlights for people that you can have broad and narrow inference populations because one of the things that I get a lot of feedback from people is people will say, well, my study is not meant to generalize. And what they actually mean is, I don't think my study is meant to generalize to the whole US. Um, and so reminding people that a population, that a narrowly defined population is still a population. Um, and then it walks people through this process. So it's gonna have graphics sort of showing you, you can pick things. Um, and it's constantly updating you on the left with information about this population. So you know something, you're learning about the population as you go. Um, and then we're working on sort of overhauls where we're gonna have a little bit more information about each of these variables. But the idea is that you could limit these um, and then it gives you at various stages at the end of each of these sections, it actually stops and gives you an update on what you did. So it's an error control for you to sort of know if you made a mistake or not. Once you get all the way to the end, I'm gonna go back to the other. Um, where did my slides go? Okay. Um, once you get to the end, it actually leaves people with the report and the report um, lists out sort of everything you've done with graphics and things that you could use in a proposal. But it also sends you, um, a, it also sends you a, um, a CV, I mean, a, a, C, um, a CSV file. It'll email it to you if you put in your email address. It emails you the CSV file and that includes lists of the schools in each strata and their contact information. So literally the idea is within an hour, you've gone through and planned a sample selection plan, gotten an Excel spreadsheet at the end, and now you can look through that Excel spreadsheet and start recruiting. Oops. Resume share. All good, okay. Um, okay, so some questions might be, well, is anybody using this? And, I, and so we've started a process of sort of um, overhauling this with a new grant. And so we've been looking back through and indeed people have been using it more over time. In the last year, it's become um, increasingly used. Um, and then this is just a list of, of examples that I have been a part of. It's not comprehensive, but places that I know have used this, the tool directly or the methods directly. Um, and so this includes both places that are doing, I think, really sophisticated studies like the National Study of Learning Mindsets, um, in which we actually did select a probability sample of schools in the US, but we stratified that sample based upon some moderators that we were interested in. But it can also involve, um, you know, just straight up using strata as a way of getting sort of, of, of defining a population and, and getting a similar sample. Okay, I'm going to pause here for questions. Should I? Um, I think it might be better if you um, try to go as far as you can. Yeah. Oh, okay, um, I'll do that. You can ask questions at the end if, uh, if, if, if there's time left. Okay, thanks. Sorry about my pacing. No okay. worries. Okay, so I'm just going to go quickly go through this last part, which is what's next, which is sort of where my thinking is right now. So I've done all of this about the average treatment effect, but now people are very interested in treatment effect heterogeneity and about understanding treatment effect heterogeneity. And, it, and what has occurred to me in that conversation is that we can only study treatment effect heterogeneity if, if we have heterogeneity in our samples. And that's not necessarily true. So I had this sort of data on what's happening in studies and realized that if we, we don't have much heterogeneity, we don't have much power. Um, and so actually the sample that you have for estimating variation in effects depends a bit on the, on the data that you have. So this is just to say, first of all, that in this framework, um, if we have a cluster randomized trial and clusters are randomized, so T is, uh, J's are sites that are being randomized and T is a treatment indicator and X is a covariate at the site level, that we would be interested in estimating not just a standardized effect size, a standardized mean difference, for example, for the effect size, but also a standardized effect size difference. Um, and that, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but that the way that we define that standard deviation really matters um, because the standard deviation of a covariate in our sample could be very different than the standard deviation of a covariate in the population. And what you're seeing when people do studies and they report these standardized mean difference or these standardized effect size differences, 
it, is they do this, they actually standardize, but it's standardized in relation to their sample, which means that every sample is different. And so if you have a very homogeneous sample, this effect might look very much bigger than if you have a very heterogeneous sample. Um, and so that's, that's not ideal. So one of the things that I've been, uh, the sort of implications of this is that we should be thinking about population standard deviations in this work. Um, the second is this is just a formula for a minimal de detectable effect size difference. And, and the point here is that this is a function of, the ver of not just the sample size, but the variation in this covariate. So if we're looking at a statistical power framework, we have to start thinking about the variation in this covariate. And we have to think about that in terms of the variation in our covariate relative to the population. Um, so this is just to say everybody, I mean, in the randomized trial world, when people talk about statistical power, it's always about the number of sites and the number of samples. I've never seen somebody talk about the, the variation in the covariate actually being an important, important, and yet we can see it's right here next to it at, this, at the same time. Okay, so to say, to show you that this is a real problem, um, this is another sort of paper which we had 19 RCTs in education, and this is looking at the variation across. So within each site, we look, or within each study, we looked at the variation in these site level variables, and then these are aggregated into a box plot. And what you can see here is that um, the orange bar says this is the variation in the sample would be the same as it is in the population. And you can see that most of the time that it's less variation. And this is actually um, the, variation being half as much, or the standard, the standard deviation being the square root of one half as much. Um, actually, most are even, you know, so let, uh, half as much variation in the sample. So this has real implications for power and your ability to estimate things. If we have homogenous samples, how are we ever going to find moderators? Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. Can you wrap up in the next minute or two? I sure can, yeah. So the okay. idea here is that we could use um, basic principles of experimental design to improve power. Um, and that's, I'm just going to kind of quickly go to, to show that what I mean by this is we should select samples that have extreme cases in them. And so we, if we can think about how to include more heterogeneity in our sample, we can actually get samples that we could estimate variation in. And so I've been thinking about sort of how do you um, shift to just thinking only about average treatment effects, but if we also are interested in understanding treatment effect heterogeneity, what would that mean for experimental design and for sample selection? And how would we, and, and how could we do that better? And how could we help people target those sites? So this last slide was really just an example of, um, from a paper I have that I, I shared with you guys, that showing that you can actually do this in an augmentation approach, which is to say, select most of your sample, for estimation of the average treatment effect. So select most of your sample so that it's similar and augment keeping a proportion of your sample um, that you actually add some more extreme data points to. So you add, you increase the heterogeneity in just a few data points and that can dramatically improve your ability to estimate heterogeneity um, in your treatment effect, very in treatment effect variation uh, without having a huge cost on your ability to estimate the average treatment effect because otherwise these are, these are very much at odds with each other. Okay, so just to wrap up, my take home points are um, the things that we know as statisticians are one thing, but how we get that information to the world and in order to change practice is another. And that in order to change practice, we actually have to take this, this sort of, this process seriously. So we have to think about really understanding users and their constraints. We need to develop methods that take these into account um, we need to find ways to default researchers into good practice. And we have to think about, I think, the front end as well as the back end and methods development. So every statistician wants to be an R programmer right now, and every statistician wants to create R packages. But I think it would be nice to see just as much thought going into the front end of, of how to actually um, help people use those methods um, without having to read dense papers. That's it. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for the nice talk and uh, also for building this fantastic web tool. It, it looks very exciting and I think a lot of us will play around with it. Um, so now we'll switch over to the discussion. We will first have uh, Andrew uh, like speak for a few minutes, then Beth can respond. And if we then have time left, and we will also take some more questions from the audience. All right, uh, I'm switching over to Andrew now.
Okay, I will screen share my comments here. So that's okay with you? Yes, I'm st I stopped sharing. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay, so you all can see my comments, is that correct? Yes. Um, okay, yeah, so I have a, I love Beth's talk. I think it's a super important work. Um, I have, I, while the talk was going on, I scrawled a few things which I'll discuss. So I'll start with my conclusion and then go back from there. So I was thinking about the audience and the audience is not um, education researchers. Uh, the audience is people who do causal inference, which I guess means some of the audience is people who just care about causal inference and want to know what the important research is in the area. And for them, I'm really glad they saw Beth's talk to realize that causal inference is um, not just about um, kind of theoretical work or computational work, um, but also not just, she didn't just come in and say, hey, I, Beth, am an applied person. You should be applied and listen to me. I'm an expert. Uh, we get enough of that from the doctors out there. Mm -hmm. Instead, she's kind of linking them and she's saying these are applied questions that, have, that, that link to the theory we care about. So those of you in the sort of larger audience, I want you to take that message um, from that this is what Beth did is important causal inference research too, rather than the idea that application is a matter of pushing a button with existing methods. Uh, the other group of the, uh, the, the audience are the organizers um, who are statisticians and econometricians um, who, um, and, and for them, I want to send you my first comment, which is that everything Beth is talking about is important for your problems too. So in a moment, I'll get to differences between education and research um, and other causal inference problems, but I don't want you to think, oh, this is something that happens in education research, but I don't really care about education research anyway. Um, I think these are very general issues. Um, the, ch the challenge of generaliz generalizing that Beth talked about, this has deep implications. So part of it is just moving beyond the idea of estimating the treatment effect, right? You have to allow for interactions. Now, luckily, Interactions are easy now because everybody here knows about multi-level modeling and machine learning prediction, which are two different ways of estimating interactions. Um, both multi-level modeling and machine learning prediction allow you to estimate complex models and they do that using regularization. You can't estimate complex models using least squares or maximum likelihood because your estimates become too noisy. They don't make sense. You end up giving bad recommendations to people or giving no recommendations at all. So we have the technical tools to do that. Um, but I think the implications are deeper. It's not just that we should be including interactions, which we should be including anyway. It's not just that you, that even, it's also like, it's an important, so I want to say just not just, but an important message is simply um, that even if an experiment is done, even if it's a randomized control trial and there's no dropout and everything goes as planned, even then there's no reason to take that number as, as meaning anything. So, so there's that, but there's more than that. So we already know, even for regular clinical trials um, in policy research and education research, we know that you can't just take the estimate and then make policy recommendations because the estimates people report are the statistically significant estimates, which means they're overestimates. It also, we know that researchers, including leading econometricians, regularly go through their data to find something statistically significant, then put it on their web page, and then spend the rest of their life promoting these things. Okay, we know that this kind of thing happens. That's true even without all the interactions. We already know that your n equals 133 study from 30 years ago in Jamaica or whatever it is, we know that you shouldn't be making policy based on that. Um, so, but this is more because now the inferences depend on the interactions and interactions are harder to estimate than main effects. So um, what, I, what we really have to do is move beyond the idea of certainty. It really means, so it really means we have to forget about the concept of the what works clearinghouse. I think that there's what works clearinghouse uh, implies that you're going to ever know what works. 
and you're not going to know what works. We have to do things even if we're not sure whether they work. And this is as difficult as, as we see in the latest the issues of coronavirus treatment, that people bounce back and forth between certainty that something works and certainty that something doesn't work. We can't do that, okay? Um, so this is, should really have to change how we think about everything. And I think this is, implies relevant for your problems too. Now, I don't have a lot of time. So now I'm gonna to go to the very end. Um, I, I, oh, I, I, so I wanted to plug a, an article by some sociology colleagues of mine on the rise of randomized control trials. It turned out in international development, they were doing them, then they stopped doing them, they started doing them again. Super interesting article I recommend you take a look at. Uh, I guess you can maybe get one of them to speak in, in your seminar, our seminar. Um, so now let's go to the end, differences between education research and the classical causal inference paradigm. So one is the business as usual comparison point. So as Beth pointed out, um, it's not that the barrier to entry is lower in education research. You don't need to get a treatment approved by the FDA. And that means when you do a treatment in a school, it may be that the control classrooms are already doing your treatment because it was already such a good idea. Um, so there is leakage there. Now, of course, I think that's going to be true in, in social research in general. Um, uh, second, uh, variation, how the treatment is performed. So Jazz Sikhan talked about that too. Um, there's no single treatment. In, indeed, the treatment sometimes is inherently interactive. Um, so you can kind of go meta on that and say, well, we know that some teachers are better than others. So the treatment is to train teachers and becoming better teachers. But it's not clear that that kind of meta thinking makes sense because fundamentally what you're, what, then the question just remains, what are you training them to do, right? So I think a lot of these kind of reduced form ideas um, don't, don't completely work here. Um, it's just in, a lot of this is inherently qualitative, um, which means maybe a lot of this quantitative evaluation stuff is going to be much more about what we can measure. So maybe we need to do quantitative evaluation of things like, is the money really being spent? Are they really hiring teachers? How many hours are they spending in the classroom? Are they doing what they claim to be doing? That kind of auditing, that's very suitable for quantitative measurement. But maybe we just can't do a good quantitative study on how effective something is. It's not a tragedy. We're still trying stuff even without quantitative studies. I we just maybe we should be focusing on what we can learn. And maybe we have to give up some of this grand idea of evidence-based policy. Maybe the evidence-based is at the level of implementation, not at the level of outcome. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry to say. Um, so I think we, we all, as I said, this is true of everything. It's really true of medical research too. Um, I think we all have to absorb these lessons, starting from the simple lesson that the average treatment effect doesn't mean anything in isolation, um, and the message that the randomized experiment doesn't automatically give you the answer you want, moving to really larger questions about what are we measuring, um, whether, whether this dream of evidence-based policy is, is really, can ever really be realized at all. All right, great. Thank you for your thoughts. Uh, Beth, do you want to respond? Uh, yeah, I mean, so Andrew and I've had a series of conversations um, before about these issues, and I, and I think we're quite aligned with a lot of the concerns. However, the place that I would um, push back a little is on the idea that maybe we can't build an evidence-based machine like this, or maybe we shouldn't. Um, the difficulty in education is that the, the, the part of education research that is focused on causality and randomized trials is actually about like this big compared to the rest of education research. Like the most of, most of education research, if you went to the American Education Research Association meeting, for example, which is huge, is qualitative work. Um, and often qualitative work that's, um, or work, you know, that the sort of, there's a lot of studies out there that are just comparing a treatment that occurred in one classroom and then some other classroom not matched in any way <laughs> to that classroom um, that you as at the causal inference community, you would die if you, you know, saw some of these studies and thought this is how people are making decisions or understanding treatment effects. Um, so to me, actually, this is about, 
you know, there is a disconnect and I, I, there's a disconnect a little bit between this extreme version of most people in education not doing anything sophisticated or understanding causality. And then a lot, and then a small group of people thinking about very advanced methods in causal inference and very advanced ways of sort of tweaking and thinking about small problems with standard errors. And, um, and that is, I mean, I'm part of WWC sorts of conversations that are often about very narrow problems. Um, and so I think there's a huge gulf. And so a lot of my thinking on this is that we've got to sort of focus a little bit in the in-between there about how to get some of that thinking that we have as statisticians that statistics is not just figuring out complex math problems, but it, there's a way of thinking in statistics, a way of seeing the world and, and thinking about problems and how do you bring that thinking to the education world, not just the formulas. That's it. Can't hear you. Uh, oh, sorry. I just realized I was I was muted. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Beth and uh, and Andrew, for this fantastic uh, discussion today. Um, we now just like to quickly have an outlook. Uh, next week, we'll have Elizabeth Ogburn from Johns Hopkins and uh, Ilya also from John, Johns Hopkins uh, have, a, have a discussion. Just one, one second. Yeah, uh, thanks again to everybody uh, for coming today. Uh, I hope to see you next week and uh, uh, stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Thank you.